Um, right. Um, hi, uh, I'm Aditya. I'm, I work as Cloud and Infra in Engineer at BrowserStack.com and I'm a contributor to Fedora admin team. Uh, today, we are going to talk about uh, building or orchestrations using Ansible. Uh, okay, let's see. Is this working? Yes, it does work. Uh, so, in particular, I'm going to cover a few topics, the challenges which we face as systems, uh, system administrator, as a DevOps person. Uh, we are going to see uh, why these, uh, what are these challenges, uh, how do we try to handle these challenges, and uh, stuff why, why the traditional uh, methodologies like uh, scripts, bash or python or ruby uh, fail to scale over a period of time. Uh, then we are going to see some new stuff that has come in uh, a couple of years ago, I suppose, stuff like Puppet or Chef. Uh, we're going to talk about them a bit. And then I'm going to move on to Ansible and uh, uh, why Ansible is better than these two guys or other guys out there. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about how, to, how do you uh, use Ansible to run ad hoc stuff or scripted stuff. Uh, I'm going to show you a demo, uh, depends on the internet, I really hope it works. And then we are going to talk about some good stuff about Ansible, like why decentralization is important and why, and the areas where Ansible actually fails. So it's not a perfect tool, but it's good enough uh, for most of the cases. So what are the pitfalls at Ansible's and uh, how as, you know, a new person who is coming into Ansible area, how the person can start uh, from the scratch or from uh, you know, existing tools like Puppet or something, right? Okay. Uh, right. So that's usually me, the guy in the wheel. <laughs> uh, as uh, as DevOps, you have uh, new servers coming in every day. Uh, you have new applications getting deployed, new features built in, right? Uh, updates, uh, and you have to act very quickly on those things. You have to. Uh, provision stuff really fast, you have to uh, give your uh, developers or your users as quick response as possible. Uh, and with, you know, uh, nowadays we have hybrid infrastructure, half of the infrastructure is in data center, co-located data centers, some of it is running out of OpenStack or EC2. The way to handle these things is a bit different. The way you handle uh, dynamic nodes of EC2 or uh, OpenStack is somewhat different than the way you handle uh, stuff within static data centers, right? So, uh, so that's one of the major problem you face. Uh, you have to worry about your initial configuration. Say I gave you an, I asked to, uh, you know, get an Nginx server. You have to make sure that your installation goes smoothly. Your configuration goes too smoothly. Uh, if you're running maybe a Rails application, your passenger or unicorn, uh, coupling with Nginx goes smoothly. A lot of things, uh, entire user management, your application management, and then tomorrow if I decide to, you know, uh, spawn another Nginx or another uh, Rails or whatever, then that should reflect, that should be exactly same to my existing machines. I do not want uh, half of my machines to run, you know, Nginx 1.0 and half of my machines to run Nginx 1.4. That can lead to uh, nightmares, seriously nightmares. So that's uh, that's what uh, that and this entire thing it keeps on happening. So it essentially becomes a loop. You'll keep on doing this over and over again. If you do not have a good tool, this can be like you know your 24/7, 365 job, uh, which is uh, again not that good. So solutions. When we when we think that okay, I'll do that. Uh, now solutions come to your mind. So what are the solutions that come to your mind? I think the most natural thing as a DevOps that come to my mind is, okay, I'll write a script. I'll, I'll just write a small script, maybe 10 lines, and then I'll be done forever. Well, that never works out. That 10 lines eventually grows. It keeps on growing, growing, growing. And then I realize, okay, that was a mistake. Maybe I should, uh, you know, have used Puppet or Chef or something like that, right? Uh, but then the uh, next thing that will come in my head is, hmm, Puppet. Would it scale? Would it be able to handle all of my infrastructure? Uh, what if it fails? What if Puppet Master goes down? What What will you do then? What will happen? I don't know how Chef works, so honestly, I don't. I I won't comment that. Uh, comment on that. But 
what if my puppet master goes down what if uh, so how many of you have used puppet a lot of lot of you guys right uh, the initial signature that happens uh, can anybody recall how that happens the initial signature when you just boot a fresh machine right uh, you have to uh, verify that the uh, verify with the puppet master about the signature. So what what will happen if your uh, say IP changes or maybe uh, you you bought a new machine but uh, now you want to make it identical but signature is not matching. You have to do manual stuff, right? Which is again a management nightmare. We want to keep the human out of picture. We want machines to do everything, right? So it will again become a nightmare about scaling and about you know ease of use and all those things so specifically talking about scripts uh, it looks dirty uh, how many of you have worked with Perl oh great okay so can you can you verify that first fact for me if you guys have used Perl a lot I mean I, I'd be really uh, happy to you know get some stats on that so uh, people usually start with scripts saying that, okay, that's maybe the 50 lines I'm going to write or 100. And then it eventually keeps on increasing, which, uh, you know, kill you in good amount of time. Uh, code repetition helps a lot, uh, happens a lot when you uh, start writing scripts. So this happened to me a lot. Uh, I, I started writing some Python Boto script for AWS. I kept on writing and then after writing around like 10 to 15 scripts, I realized that almost all the scripts which I have written have uh, have those few lines of code which will do auth, which was really, I think, uh, stupid on my part. I should have maybe created a library and just did import auth library, something like that. But while writing those first initial few scripts, you will never realize that, uh, you know, that should have been, uh, that code repetitive repetition should have been avoided. So you will think, okay, that's only two scripts which I have to do ever, three, four, and then before you know it just becomes a huge mammoth, right? So uh, that thing should have been uh, avoided. Then you have to remember order of execution. Uh, reason I'm saying this is uh, if you guys have again work with Rails or something like that, uh, you need to make sure that you install stuff in the right order. So you have to make sure that you first get Nginx there then you get unicorn or passenger there then you get your application there and in between somewhere after your uh, installation of nginx before installation of unicorn you have to get your database there if you are using multiple database like we at browser stack do both mongo and mysql then you make sure that both of them are there before you actually start the application and if these this order gets mixed up you will get you know uh, You'll need those sleeping bills, trust me, because uh, nothing will start. It will give you funny errors and then you'll keep on debugging. And lastly, uh, writing scripts, if you don't write documentation, you're in for, you know, a big surprise after six months because most probably you will not be able to read your own code. That happens with me a lot. Okay. Um, right. So now, uh, Puppet is the de facto answer for most of us, Puppet or Chef, is the de facto answer for the shortcomings of scripts which we have used uh, since so many years, right? Uh, but when we talk about Puppet or Chef, uh, it needs an agent to run on client, right? Puppet client uh, on the client machine. And that agent, that agent has to verify with the master first before doing anything. Uh, another shortcoming I'd say is that Puppet is based on Ruby and Ruby is not shipped with Linux by default, right? So you have to install Ruby before you install Puppet and that step cannot go in Puppet, of course, because your Puppet agents are not there. Uh, both Puppet and, uh, uh, Puppet and Chef have their own DSL. So it becomes a bit difficult to do uh, parsing and all. The DSL will only be uh, only can be understood by the puppet or chef on their own. You cannot write an external parser probably to understand that kind of stuff. Uh, again, my experience with puppet has been a bit rusty. If you guys have any criticism on this one, uh, I'm all ears. Any anything uh, till now? 
yes no again uh, that doesn't help uh, with the installation of ruby right agreed that you can do nodeless puppet and you can save maybe the first point signature problems with ami right you have to verify with puppet master so you will make an agentless puppet and create an ami and then uh, you have to you also have to as soon as your ami boots you have to take a git pull to maybe get your entire configuration you have to do all those steps beforehand, right? Before your server will become usable, right? Anything else? Cool. Uh, okay. So now then, uh, with keeping all these uh, shortcomings in mind, uh, let me introduce you uh, to Ansible. Uh, Ansible is uh, based on YAML. So YAML. Uh, YAML is easily parsable. It's a serialized language. Uh, it can be parsed by any third party library you can think of. Most of the languages have a YAML parser. Uh, it uses OpenSSH as transport. You do not have to worry about uh, that key signatures and all those things. Because as soon as, as long as you can SSH to the server, that's it. That is all is required to run Ansible. Uh, Parallel ordered execution. One crib, uh, I don't know, it's my personal crib with Puppet. Uh, most of you guys may not agree with it. So my crib with Puppet is that uh, its order is not, uh, you know, serial. It can run anything after anything before anything. Now you'll say that use notify, use before. Why? Somebody trying to say something. I'm not. Puppet 3 solves it to a certain extent. Yeah, okay. Maybe the newer one and also to a certain extent. That doesn't really, you know, convince me. <laughs> I want it to be solved for all the extents. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Yeah, maybe maybe they have also realized that it should be serial and eventually it will reach there. But till it reaches there, I may, you know, as well move on to something else, which is, which already has solved my problems. Uh, and again, the best of it is that there is no requirement of any agent on uh, on my nodes. My nodes, as soon as they are booted up, they are good to go. I don't need to install in something like, you know, uh, Ansible agent or thing like that. That helps me a lot. Uh, just, just so that we go ahead, I want to tell you about the scale at which we are currently using Ansible. I'm using Ansible at these two places, uh, both at Fedora project as well as at browserstack.com. Uh, we at Fedora project, we are currently using it on 300 plus Linux servers. Uh, most of them running Fedora or RHEL and there are 100 plus stacks. Uh, when I, when I'm saying server, I am including virtual machines. I mean, not necessarily they're all physical servers, right? So that's one thing. Uh, Browserstack.com has 300 plus uh, Nix servers right now. Not necessarily all of them are Linux, but it's a mixture. And uh, we have around 20 plus stacks there. We are able to peacefully manage uh, our infrastructure using Ansible. So at this scale, I, I can guarantee you that that Ansible works. I haven't tried it beyond 300, so I'm not really sure, but I think it should work. We haven't seen any issues. Uh, that said, we have only run uh, Ansible on all the servers simultaneously on a very few occasions. Most of it is like, okay, it's Apache stack, so I'll run everything on Apache stack, which is which would be like 15, 20 servers at a time. Uh, we did run on all the servers during Heartbleed because we had to update, uh, you know, OpenSSL on all the servers, and that went pretty smoothly. Not a lot of issues. Okay, um, so that's the scale I'm talking about. <sighs> Okay, how do you install Ansible? Again, uh, on, on your Ansible master node, which could be your laptop, you do not need to have a static server for Ansible. I run Ansible from my laptop. Anybody who is capable of taking a git pull and doing and running either of these commands, yum, apt, and pip, they can run Ansible on their machines without any problem and do production grade stuff you do not need to, uh, you know, maintain a separate puppet server. So that's yet another advantage, which I would say. 
this I have already mentioned, if you can SSH, you can run Ansible. As long as this bare minimum requirement is met, you can run Ansible. You don't need to manage separate ACLs. So, yet another problem with uh, maybe scripts and maybe, uh, you know, your uh, configuration management tools is that you need to have certain set, set of ans uh, ACLs. Otherwise, things can go haywire. For example, uh, the client which we have for Puppet, it, uh, it runs as root, right? As soon as something malicious, something bad has gotten into your uh, manifests or something, something has entered your uh, repo, your manifest repo, it will be executed on all the production servers, even, uh, you know, and that too as root. So that's a very, very major security problem, right? With Ansible, you don't need to worry about because Ansible runs as you, your user by which you default login. If you have the privileges to execute that stuff, then only Ansible will be able to execute that stuff, right? So for example, if maybe as a user Aditya, I cannot uh, create more users. So if I run Ansible as user Aditya, it won't be able to create more users on my remote machine. No matter how many uh, you know, malicious or bad code I have written in my Ansible repo, it will not be executed until unless the right guy is executing it. Who has the privileges to do that on your remote machines. Cool? Any questions so far? Okay. Um, Okay, somebody has a question. Right. Uh, how do you how do you set up your initial SSH access for multiple users? Right. Um, Especially when you are doing it at a much higher scale. For a couple of machines, it's easy to do manually. But if it's like like you said, you three hundred plus servers. Mm -hmm. How do you manage that? Give each user their SSH key, or then they should be able to uh, log in okay. with Ansible using those SSH key for their users. Right. So uh, let me see how we do it is, uh, for example, in browser stack, we boot machine from uh, EC2, right? That EC2 AMI has one key. Agreed? That one key has pseudo privileges, right? So I will run Ansible by that user to create all the other users and put the keys there. That solves my problem. I didn't install any agent. I had to do almost nothing, just Ansible run. And that solved everything. All my user management is done. My package management is done. My application is there. It got started. And probably if I can, I think if I can try, I'll put that stuff in Route 53 as well. So I'm, I'm actually basically good to go as long as I have booted a machine and run Ansible on that once. That is it. Uh, is like this is uh, tied up to AWS. Is there any generic solution that people can use? Uh, I'm not able to see you, but uh, <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, with respect to AWS, uh, so we do not use we use generic Ansible modules. Okay, but uh, Ansible has recently come up with a, a AWS library which which specifically deals with AWS in a very very good way. I personally haven't used it but I am assuming that it would be way better than what we are doing. So this stuff has been written very generically and we are doing a lot of generic stuff. Ansible, there is a specific library to deal with EC2 guys and uh, I am assuming that should be very nice. Uh, I had a question. How yeah. do you push uh, updates to a specific set of servers? How do you discover inventory? And I'll take up I'll take up that as a demo. I'll show you how to do that. Okay. So you dynamically discovery dynamic uh, Okay, discovery. dynamic discovery is something which is uh, I think which would be a part of EC2 module. Uh, so, say for a specific application type. How do right, you right. I, I think it would it's it would be a part of EC2 module. What right now we do is that we use tagging and we discover it on the basis of name tags. Uh, but I think as that Ansible module of EC2 comes out, uh, that will be inbuilt in it. So uh, if the instances are retired, they need to be updated with tags? Or... Right, right. Okay. Uh, but when, when you boot your machine, I think that usually is a part of automation. At least that is the case for us, that when we boot up a machine, 
that entire thing, uh, tagging, uh, selecting instance type, selecting region, zone, everything is a part of that booting up phase. So that usually... So uh, when, you are, when you are asking a command to be executed, right? Or yeah, to command. start a machine you have to, I mean, so Ansible you, cannot start a machine, right? How, how do you like push updates when you don't know what are the servers beforehand? Ha, right, so that's what I'm uh, telling you. Uh, if you do not know the servers beforehand and if it's an environment like EC2, usually you don't know servers beforehand in an environment like EC2. For a colo environment, you'll know it beforehand. Uh, if it is an environment like EC2, uh, what you can do there is uh, you can probably um, use name-based taggings, EC2 tags, one thing. Another thing is that in inventory, you can use regex. So if all of your machines come up like, uh, you know, uh, web1.abc.com, web2.abc.com, then you can just use regex and that will also solve your problem. Beyond that, I think if your case is something very specific, so, then maybe we have to do something from the uh, For every command that you run, mm -hmm. it's going through SSH. So for every right. command, it will try to do SSH each and every time. Isn't that an overhead? Yes, there is. That is an overhead. But, okay, uh, right. What happens is that uh, there is something known as accelerate mode. What Now, what happens in accelerate mode is that uh, the connection uh, is not establish again and again uh, there is so when ansible daemon launches when ansible starts there on your uh, remote machine it opens up another service on port on some port i think it was okay i'm, I'm not able to recall but it will open a service which will take further calls so that service will keep on working between you two guys and uh, and there will be no connection reestablishment and tear down for 30 minutes, which is configurable. By default, for 30 minutes, you don't need to reestablish the uh, you know uh, connection. The that entire uh, communication is AES encrypted, so you don't need to worry about security as well. Uh, so yeah, that that's how accelerate mode is not on by default. You can turn it on because not everybody likes to launch another daemon. Uh, I. At Fedora, we have uh, accelerate mode on on most of the stuff. Very, very rarely we turn it off. Okay. Hi. Uh, Hi. Does it work only with SSH or anything else like Mosh or something? So, as I said, it is. Uh, you can deploy from means you can do your config management from your laptop. Mm -hmm. Think of it as you are in a Wi-Fi network. Okay. You start uh, like doing your uh, start your uh, configuration. So maybe if it switches an uh, access point. So Mosh like Mosh is basically where it allows you to do the roaming as well. Mm -hmm. So does it work on Mosh or is it only uh, it does it work on only SSH? Okay. Uh, the remote server is running Open SSH, right? Yeah, it is. Uh, That's it. Okay. If if the remote if, server needs to run Open SSH. Okay. If it has a uh, mosh, mosh uh, still it doesn't matter to us. You are talking about a scenario where remote servers does not have open SSH? Yeah. I'm not entirely sure. Never tried that. <laughs> I never saw a server without open SSH. So I'm, I don't know. I'm not really sure. Okay, thank you. Hey. Uh, as long as it uh, follows standard SSH, uh, you know, handshaking and everything, it should work. Mostly SSH is just a transport protocol. So if that transport is able to uh, connect you to the remote server. The rest is in Python, which is bundled by default with all the Linux. <coughs> One question. So Python also should be installed, right? Uh, I think it's 2.4 at least. No, no. Is that also a prerequisite that need to be there? Present? All all the Linux servers are you know having Python by default. By default. Hey. Uh, if a server doesn't have Python, I think uh, yum and app will stop, which anyways is you know disabling everything. Right. Um, is there a way for Ansible to know, like, suppose you said uh, you have 300 servers, mm -hmm. I assume you divide it into clusters, say, 100, yes. 100 of this type, 100 yes, of that yes. type. If a machine goes down, yes. does Ansible know? No. It's it's not monitoring uh, monitoring that thing. Uh, no. So, so next time you, suppose you want to run a command on, mm -hmm. one command on your cluster of type A, uh, if one of the machines has gone down, Ansible will go and 
it'll it'll do its stuff on rest of the machines. That one machine, it'll fail. It didn't block or anything. No problems there. Uh, it'll just fail. Uh, rest of the stuff will have. Rest of the servers will have uh, whatever you wanted to do. Okay. So, so you have to use use some other method to. Uh, tell Ansible that this machine is now gone, so don't try it. Yes, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, so I'm assuming that your monitoring would be smart enough to know that right. a machine has gone down. Right. Once your monitoring detects a machine has go, gone down, maybe you can pull that uh, particular machine out of your inventory. Okay. And uh, once you have pulled it out of your inventory, your uh, Ansible will not execute on that. Okay. I, I'll just show you how to do inventory okay. file, which is straightforward. Uh, target host it runs a separate thread so even if one target node is down it's not going to block anything else yeah. that just one node it is it'll just fail for that particular machine rest all will go over anything else okay cool okay so now uh, it's demo time let's see so for the demo my target is to get you uh, to this screen Okay, this is the default Word, WordPress screen, right? Create a configuration file. I'm going to boot a machine in front of you and I'm going to, while I start Ansible, I'm going to walk you through the entire Ansible playbook, which I have. Uh, consider playbook as, you know, analogous of uh, modules or manifests which you have. Ansible is capable of running both scripted stuff, which is Ansible playbook, and it is capable of running ad hoc commands on demand. Okay. So say if you want to do, you know, uh, yum update open SSL, you don't need to write a playbook for that. You can just do, do it via command line on all of your machines. So what, uh, what I have planned is that I will, uh, go till second last step using a playbook and last step I'm going to do it via ad hoc so that you get a taste of both of them. Okay. Right. Sounds good. Okay. So we want to reach here from ground zero. Okay. Let's minimize this. Okay. Next thing I'm going to boot a new machine. So, okay. Nothing happened. Oh no, it's doing that. I'll take the smallest possible machine. And I don't know, maybe Singapore use a Fedora machine. Oh, okay. I must write a host name. Okay. So while this is going on, let me show you the. Okay, is it visible till the very end? Can you guys at the end see what's written there? Okay, okay. Uh, let's see. Better? Okay. So, uh, this is what uh, YAML looks like. I hope it's readable, right? So what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to run all of the stuff on demo hosts, which we will define uh, once we get the machine up. And uh, we are going to build a WordPress stack. What does a WordPress stack requires? Can anybody help me with that? If you want to get a WordPress up and running, what do you need? Apache, PHP, MySQL, right? These are the three things which we need. Apache, PHP, and MySQL. So we are going to get all of these and uh, we'll see. Okay. Uh, okay. Someone, can someone read these few lines till PHP, MySQL, ND? Can someone who doesn't know Ansible explain what it's trying to do? Anyone? Uh, because uh, this guy, uh, Ansible runs Python, right? So I need 
Python to interact with MySQL. I'm going to build my databases from absolute zero. Okay, so yeah, anybody who's uh, willing to explain what I'm trying to do there? Yep, go on. Uh, it's trying to uh, install Apache, PHP, and other dependencies. Okay. Uh, it's using the YUM package manager, Yay. and the state that it needs uh, in the end is installed. Mm -hmm. It wants uh, to install HTTPD, PHP, MySQL server, and MySQL Python package along right. with PHP, MySQL. And right, right, that's right, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Did you know Ansible before that? No. Right, so, but you were able to understand what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that that's what I'm uh, trying to say that uh, using a good uh, language, using a good DSL actually helps you reduce documentation a lot, right? So that even a first time or new guy who hasn't worked with it will be able to understand what's going on. Okay, we have the machine up, and that is my IP. Okay, so yeah, I'm supposed to show you inventory file as well. I already would have it here. Where is my mouse, man? Yep. Okay, so this is the host file. Uh, I'm going to define a host here. Right. So what I'm doing is, uh, it, it follows the any format. If you guys have ever seen a PHP any file format, PHP any configuration, you basically, you can create clusters which are enclosed in a square bracket and you can provide the machines underneath. This can take regex, this can take uh, domain names, not necessarily IPs. Uh, you can put it, put anything there. Uh, you can put multiple servers in one cluster. You can put one server in multiple clusters. Both works, right? So if you have a machine which, which acts as you know uh, MySQL, which acts as maybe or Redis or Mongo or, or everything, you can define separate clusters and put a single IP on all those clusters and manage them separately. Okay, so that all is supported there. So I'm just going to save this. Um, okay. We'll be back to our demo tab. Okay. Right. So I'm going to run this Ansible playbook, the one which is written here. While that playbook would be running, I'm going to explain you how, uh, how this all will work. So uh, keep a, keep an eye on the upper tab, upper smaller area, because I'm actually, yep, it's working, okay. The internet is a bit flaky, otherwise I would have shown you uh, both of them separately, but it's really slow on the internet here. So, okay, not good internet. Hmm. Try again. It hopes that it works. Yep. Okay. Just flaky internet. Okay. So it's just gonna execute those steps which we are going to talk about here on the tab down here. Okay. I need more volunteers. Can somebody explain what this section will do? the next section anybody yep basically creating user and granting him privilege no no uh, okay so. i'm talking about the section above <laughs> that one start the uh, http uh, the so first starting uh, http daemon and mysql daemon right and then then granting privilege to a uh, root user from from your local host right right yeah. so again uh, so yeah the the section there do we have a pointer or something here 
No, we don't have it. Okay. No issues. So the section, the topmost section is going to uh, start the HTTPD and MySQL services. Okay, thank you. The section, this, this section is going to start the HTTPD and MySQL service. The section here is going to update root password for localhost root account. So when you get a default My, uh, MySQL install on most of the machines, it's set with no password, right? Uh, there's no root password and of course that's a security hazard. So we are going to set a root password. This password will be picked from this variable, MySQL root password. It, this is how variables work in uh, Ansible, in YAML actually. So I, I just defined that variable here. You can pull out variables and put it in a separate file. Just for the sake of demo, I have put it here. But you can split this thing into various files. You can put the uh, variable somewhere else, template somewhere else. You can put, uh, you know, the pull out the entire thing. Maybe put yum dependencies somewhere else and services somewhere else. Actually, it's a good practice to do, do that. It becomes more flexible. But uh, for demo, let's do this. Okay. Uh, can some sorry? Can someone explain me the section right here? Meanwhile, you guys are seeing what, what's happening there, right? It just finished. Can someone explain me the section which is uh, here? So, uh, so you're copying uh, the my config file mm -hmm. uh, with the with the root password credentials, right? To the uh, to the source of slash home of that user, and then you're giving a pre you're giving a permission, right? Right, right. So you're taking a template and then you're 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 making it applicable right. uh, to the slash root dot and my config. Right, right, right. Correct. I am using template. In template, there is a variable defined just like this, and the value of the variable is uh, picked from the above. So I want to keep my passwords in you know as few places as possible. So I will ideally define a variable file where I'll keep my password and maybe keep that file out of reach of anyone else. And then I will make Ansible use templates and variables and uh, you know, apply those to wherever is required. So uh, one question, I mean like, if that yeah. is the case then why, I mean like, uh, in Chef you uh, create a template of that particular thing and you fix a variable and then you write it in the cookbook and then you, when you deploy it, it does it automatically, right? So what, I mean, what's the reason you using you hiding it in this folder, I mean, in the user folder, and then you sending it to the root folder of that. No, no. And then... Okay, this this location is just Abed. I could have used any other location. Sorry. Nice music, man. Sorry, I didn't get it. Sorry. Uh, I'm saying, are you talking? Uh, are you talking that why I'm putting it here? Yeah, that's right. That's a random location. I just felt like I'm. No, 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 not the, not with that. I mean, like the dot of my dot ah, again again random you could have done abc ansible rocks and it would have just worked fine okay. it's it's mostly for clarity it has nothing to do with how it works you no, could I mean, have like generally chef cop i mean keeps mm -hmm. these configuration files as a templates right right so right. when you deploy that this uh, this configuration file of what the template is there will will get deployed like a configuration file on the destination server right. So, so, so does Ansible goes in that fashion that, you know, with, uh, or Ansible else it is, their... is, yeah. So Ansible is flexible in that sense. It can go that way. You can have a dedicated directory where you keep all your templates. You can, uh, you know, put a dot template extension or whatever you want, or just like this, I didn't put any extension because I don't care. Okay. It's, it's flexible to that extent that as long as this path exists and this file exists, it will work. Okay. okay. So that's not a problem. It really depends on convention. By default, what you're saying is actually good convention. The template should be at one centralized place, yeah. probably. Yeah. Mostly with their modules. Okay. Uh, mostly with their playbooks to be mm. very, uh, you know, sound ansibly. Okay. You have to, uh, you should uh, technically put them with their modules. Okay. Thanks. This is usually actually the default location, so I've used this. Uh, I thought it will be more clear, but I was clearly wrong. Yep. Uh, in case I want to do a partial update to any of the configuration files, uh, like 
only a particular username or password. I want to use the default configurations, but just update a few parts of it. So how's it possible over here? Uh, it's, I think it's very similar to how you do it in uh, Puppet or Chef or something. You just pull out the file, make whatever changes you want to do as, put them as variables, as uh, templates or whatever. And then only if the changes are to be done, then only the changes will be propagated. If the file is same as the server file, it will not go there. Uh, in Puppet, there is a, a tool that, that's called Augies, which is uh, used to analyze certain configuration files and change them. And there are multiple, what they, they call as lens, that are available for different configuration files. For example, there could be a lens for my.cnf, which understands the MySQL um, configuration file. Mm -hmm. And you can take it from a template, okay. use this lens mm -hmm. to then modify it based on what your requirements. Okay, okay. Similarly, there are lens for other commonly mm -hmm. used uh, configuration files, uh, maybe smb.conf okay. and various others. Mm -hmm. That's a very useful tool in Puppet because then you don't have to write your own logic mm -hmm. to insert your configuration data in these templates. Okay. Um, are you familiar with any such tool Mm. in uh, Ansible or do you uh, think how, how would you do that in Ansible without writing a lot of code yourself? Uh, first question, uh, no I'm not actually familiar, actually I wasn't familiar about the lens itself uh, but that's a good tool I suppose. Uh, at the moment no, th I don't think there is such tool uh, for Ansible to generate configuration. Uh, how we have done it in past is that we have had templates and we uh, we just push those templates and those templates are only pushed if there are changes. So just like Puppet or Chef, it analyzes the diff and if the diff is there, it pushes the configuration. Uh, about generating configuration, I am not sure. I don't think uh, there is a related tool specific to Ansible to do that. Uh, but clearly I might be wrong. There are so many of those things out there these days. Uh, not, the, not that I'm aware of. Really sorry. Uh, okay, uh, anyone else? Should we move to the next section? Okay. Um, basically, this is useless, doesn't execute. Right. Uh, that actually doesn't execute. I didn't know, don't know why I have run. Right, uh, can someone explain me this one? Okay, uh, I think I have overdone it. Let's just be, okay, so this is what, what was being done. We installed everything. Uh, we downloaded WordPress, Apache user owned the directory. IP tables was running. I'm just gonna show you one fast, quick command. Uh, one ad hoc command which I promise and then we'll wrap up. Uh, I again lost one. Right, so this is how you run ad hoc commands. I have to allow basically port 80 for everything, anything to work there. Uh, so I'm going to just allow port 80 using uh, Ansible ad hoc command. I'm going to do it for all the machines that are part of demo cluster and I'm going to run this command, okay? Okay, uh, while this is running, let's just, uh, this is all which we discussed. Uh, we already talked about this. Okay, uh, just some pitfalls of Ansible. Uh, it's new, so as uh, someone pointed out the lenses and all, uh, there are not many auxiliary tools available around Ansible at the moment, but I'm sure uh, we'll catch up. The smaller, there's a smaller community as compared to Puppet and all. Uh, so it takes time. Windows is not supported. I think Puppet and Chef have started supporting Windows. So that's one drawback. If you are, if you have Windows in your infrastructure, then there's a problem. VMware ESXi is a problem because nothing works there. Uh, no, no Puppet, no Ansible, no Chef. 
If you want to start, just install Ansible, start with ad hoc commands, and check out the tutorial at getting started. It's a very basic tutorial, it'll help you a lot. Uh, okay, the command worked, success. Right, what I'm going to do is, again, I've lost my mouse. Just going to copy this IP and Right, so we have gotten there. Cool. Okay. Uh, I'm already running. I think I've eaten up five minutes of somebody else. So if you guys have any questions, any doubts or anything, I'll be available downstairs. You can talk to me.